<laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for a nice introduction, Matt. Um, yeah, my, my website, uh, how many people have been there? All of you are here at one time. Uh, it, it's uh, www.bullrunnings.wordpress.com if you're interested. And that's where I put a lot of primary documents associated with the, the campaign. Letters, diaries, memoirs, newspaper articles, uh, after action reports, official correspondence, uh, joint test, testimony before, before the joint congressional test testimony before, before the Joint Congressional Committee on the Conduct of the War and all, anything, I could, anything you can think of. And if you could think of anything that I don't have up there, please let me know. You know we'll get it up there at some point in time. I'm not really anticipating this is going to end. Uh, this is about the, I think I said, I said it was about the eighth or ninth time I've done this talk. And I've never done it the same way twice. Sometimes it runs long, so I'm going to try and go a little faster tonight because we only have so much time. I mean tonight. Tonight we only have so much time. I'm sure we all have plenty of time ahead of us other than that. So I'll start uh, by letting you know that it, it, uh, this isn't your normal Civil War roundtable presentation. I, I don't like to be lectured to. It's, I, I got it from when I was a kid, I guess. Uh, I much prefer it. So if something, you've got a, a question pertinent to that particular thing that we're talking about, um, raise your hand and I'll either answer the question then or I'll tell you, it's Prego. Remember that commercial for, for the uh, spaghetti sauce? Prego, or oh, paprika, it's in there, okay? It's, it means it's coming up. I'll go Prego, it means it's gonna, well, we'll get to it in a minute. And then afterwards, about the presentation or about the first battle of Bull Run in general or my website or, or, or anything else, just fire away, I'll be here and they have to leave. Um, Let's start with a, a little back and forth. Why do we study history? Why is it important to study history? So we won't repeat it. So we won't repeat it? Yeah, that works. <laughs> Anything else? Sometimes it works. Sometimes, sometimes. I usually get a, a couple of different answers to this, like, oh, you know, you, you need to know what, where you come from to enter in this position, from whence you come. Um, but uh, I, I kind of... There were some magazines uh, uh, that uh, question to several historians. By the way, I don't bill myself as that. I, I didn't go to school for history. Um, I try to be a good historian, but I am not. I don't call myself one of those. But uh, they uh, maybe five guys, and they all answered in paragraphs. And um, I got a note asking me what I thought, and I answered pretty much. This was my answer. It shows ordinary people uh, behave under extraordinary circumstances. That's why we study. We want to see ordinary people behave under extraordinary circumstances. And the most extraordinary circumstances pretty much are what? Military, right? You can't get much more extraordinary circumstance than people trying to kill each other. Um, now by extension, that indicates uh, that can, learning about that can indicate what is appropriate behavior under a similar set of circumstances, right? So when we read about the Civil War, we want to know how so-and-so acted and how that can influence us later on if we're presented with a similar set of circumstances, right? Because you want to be like, uh, you want to be like Grant, you don't want to be like Bragg. Or you choose your analogy there. Uh, now, in order for us to do that, in order for us to really learn uh, from what they did, we have to understand what their intentions were, right? And I would posit that in Civil War history, we're really sloppy. And uh, we usually work backwards. We say, this is, I think, uh, what their, their intentions were, and this is what they did. But this is what I think their intentions were, rather than establishing what their intentions were based on what they said at the time. Um, so tonight, when I about McDowell's plan, which is probably going to be different. Unless, how many of you have seen the program before, online or anything? Because it's been on a couple different places. Okay, that's good. Um, it's probably different from your understanding of what McDowell's plan was. How many people here have read a book on the Civil War in general, like the whole Civil War, like McPherson or something like that, right? 
And how many of you have read a book on Gettysburg? <laughs> how about Antietam? How about a book on just on, only on, the first battle of Bull Run? Three. Three of you. All right. And how many of those were not Jack Davis? <laughs> okay. Good. Now it's, uh, what is it, that now 50-year-old, um, uh, what do you call that? Scholarship, right? 50-year-old scholarship. Not a lot happens in 50 years. Um, so anyway, Dorn, I'm not going to say I found this trunk. I found McDowell's trunk in his, in his house in <coughs> Buffalo, New York, or something like that. Or, or I found his paper. Because whether you know it or not, there aren't any. There's 10 letters. 10 letters uh, that he wrote during the war that we know of. We don't know where the others are. I'm, I'm convinced they're out there. We just don't know where they are. Um, so this is all going to be based on what we already have presented before us. So it's all going to be based on who's – somebody said there's some lawyers out here. Okay, because if there are any, there's, because they're lawyers, they're not raising their hands. Right? But you guys who are lawyers out there and aren't admitting it will probably have heard this before. Um, if, you, if you have your closing arguments, and I explained this to the fellows at dinner before, if you have closing arguments and you're talking to the jury about how they should make this decision, and you say, well, we know, we know that the defendant wanted to kill the victim, right? But no evidence had been presented prior to this closing argument. Is he allowed to do that? No, he's not allowed to do that. Why isn't he allowed to do that? It's because he's using something called facts not in evidence. Basically, he's saying this is a fact, but it hasn't been, pre it hasn't pre been presented before the court and proven to be fact or accepted as fact by anyone or even argued to be fact. Um, so I'm going to say that a lot of what we know about McDowell's plan is based on facts not in evidence. Okay? Um, so let's get started. And I'm going to try to get our minds right and wrapped around this. So we're going to start with a football press conference. They have football down here in uh, Maryland, after fashion, I understand. Um, so, so let's assume this is a football coach, and it is. Uh, and since we're in fantasy land, I mean, and since we're in Maryland, we're going to say this is his press conference after a loss to Maryland, as if that would ever happen. But it's after a loss to Maryland. My, my, I read that Norman Vincent Peale book before I came down here called How to Win Friends and Influence People. How am I doing so far? <laughs> Not too good? Okay. Um, so let's keep this scenario in mind. We've got a press conference. And the head coach, after the loss, addresses the media and says, our plan was to expose their secondary. Who understands football? Not there. Okay, good. Um, he says, our, our, our plan was to expose their secondary. We thought we could do that. And if we did that, that would open up the running game, but we were unable to do that. So our plan failed. Right? Now, you're all sports writers out there. My son back there is a sports writer, but the rest of you are all sports writers right now. You're going to go and you're going you're gonna write to uh, write your article, right? I'm going to write my story, and that's going to be my headline that uh, Nittany Lions were unable to expose the Terrapin, again, as if that would ever happen. Um, but then be before you write that article, you're going to say, hey, I better watch the game again and make sure that makes sense. So you go to the, you go to the game uh, film, and you find that the Lions' first three possessions consisted of three running plays and a punt. Now, this is in conflict with Coach's explanation of what happened, isn't it? Because if you would think if that's what they would really do, they'd come out throwing the ball. They didn't. They came out throwing the ball. So this doesn't make sense. In other words, it's inexplicable that that's what they did, right? It's inexplicable. So you're, you're presented with, uh, you're presented with a, a quandary. How do I write this article? Well, I got one other thing up my sleeve, I have the quarterback's playbook. I have the big red dog, Sean Clifford's playbook. 
or his iPad or whatever it is they use these days. And I look at that and I coach his instructions. We must first establish the running game in order to open up the secondary. All right. So what's inexplicable now? Not the game, not what happened in the game, the coach's explanation afterwards. All right? So you have to look at all the sources. Sometimes when things don't add up, when you have inexplicables, they can be traced to single underlying assumptions. You have to question those assumptions. Excuse me, I do have to read some of this stuff. Uh, if you reconsider those underlying assumptions, and by doing so, explain the inexplicable. What does that tell you about the explanation that you got from the coach? He was coach bullshit. He was coach bullshit. Exactly. Oh, am I allowed to say that when we're being broadcast? OK. So let's start with the sources that you're going to use to write about the first battle of Bull Run. And historically, this is how it's gone. This is the first source people use. Everybody familiar with this book? I used to actually lug all these books with me in a big bag, and I decided I'm just going to take a photo of it and put it on there. That's my family room carpet. Can't tell because it's been vacuumed. It doesn't usually look like that. Um, the report on the conduct of the war, which is a shortened version of the final report and testimony of the Joint Congressional Committee on the Conduct of the War. They usually use, leave one of you. Um, and this is where, uh, after um, a couple of setbacks to the Union, notably Ball's Bluff, uh, the radical members of Congress formed this committee to find out what the heck is going on and how do we fix things. And, and more importantly, just like joint committees today, who do we blame? We've got to blame somebody. They put up these hearings, and one of the hearings, a series of hearings and testimony, was on the first battle of Bull Run and what happened. So much, about, much, much of what we know about McDowell's plan is based on his testimony, what he said it was, and the testimony of the people that were there. Has anybody read much of the Joint Committee of the Congression, of, you know, the whole thing, CCCW? Maybe you've read Bruce Tapp's book, Over Lincoln's Shoulder which is about that. Uh, and there was another book uh, specifically about the, the Gettysburg uh, campaign and Meade and all that that was written specifically about Meade and the uh, Joint Committee. Um, so that's where we usually start. Um, and that was in late 1861-62. Uh, other sources, uh, if you will, uh, the game film, game film, the uh, War of the Rebellion. I don't know how that got on there. That shouldn't be on there. But anyway, oh yeah, it's another source. You can go on here and you can find lots and lots of letters and whatnot. And of course, everything in that book there, uh, War of the Rebellion, Official Records of the Union Confederate Army Series 1, Volume 2, which is where Bull is. Uh, but you don't need that book anymore if you want to read the reports from you can go onto my website, and uh, I transcribed them all there. Uh, so that's like your game film, right? This is what actually happened. The first book, uh, first book is a press conference, right? These couple of sources here, or books, collections of letters that have letters uh, written by participants or whatever. Uh, more contemporaneous accounts, let's say. Um, and then you have what other people wrote about it. And here you have, I don't know if Maryland has ever had anything like this. University of Maryland ever had anything like this? Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is, uh, let's see. That's, that's, we have a cottage on a lake up on Lake Erie. That's our neighbor, Greg Garrity. Uh, this guy right here is one of my very best friends. And for years, he used to walk around grabbing all the copies of this at all of our friends' houses and autographing it across Greg Garrity's face. Um, <laughs> Anyway, you did that. So there's, there's your, uh, your version of, uh, of um, what other people wrote. Okay, So sports writers wrote a story about what happened there at the game. These guys wrote stories about what happened at the battle. Anybody have either that first set or this book here? Anybody? This is R.M. Johnson. 
uh, Bull Run is strategy and tactics, and this is uh, Steel American Campaigns, a two-volume set. One of them is maps, and one of them is, is narratives. Of, uh, that's all uh, American campaigns up till when he wrote this book. This book here was written by a military man, okay? First history ever uh, commissioned by the U.S. Army to be used. Um, I can't remember if it was at the War College or, or at, uh, I can't remember if this was at, Car was to be used at Carlisle or Leavenworth or Washington, one of those three places. Um, and this is written by an academic, R.M. Johnson. He, he taught at Yale. Interestingly enough, one of these books used the official records and one of them di didn't. Anyone want to guess which one didn't? Wrong. Johnson used the OR because he worked at Yale and Yale could afford the OR. He worked, uh, still worked for the OR in the coffee organization. <laughs> but he used a lot of memoirs and, and uh, narratives and, and um, other things. And uh, Johnson actually used the ORs uh, a lot. And, uh, the interesting thing is these books were written for officers to learn how to be combat or, or uh, how to plan a plan a campaign or a battle tactic strategy that kind of stuff. Right? So these were written with lessons in mind that they wanted the uh, the officers to learn. This book was written academically. What happened? I prove it. Okay. So there's two different ends to that. But essentially, from these two, we get the same story about McDowell's plan. Uh, Johnson alludes to some of the things that I'm going to point out, but he doesn't really jump in with both feet. Um, this book here, anybody read that one? Soldiers and Scholars of the U.S. Army and the Uses of Military History from 1865 to 1920 by Carol Reardon. So, a friend of mine, anybody know Carol? Jim knows Carol, you guys know Carol. He's a wonderful, real live military historian. Just because you're a historian who happens to write about it, doesn't mean you're writing military history. There's, there's more to it than that, and that's why things are going to cut short uh, in my talk tonight so that I can get this thing done in time. Um, oh, sorry. This is that playbook thing. It's, this is, this is a, a version of apparently what they, uh, they put on, on uh, the quarterback's wrist these days that tells you what's going on. What's the, what's the game plan? What are the game plan? You can also find a game plan right there in the, uh, the War of the Rebellion official records. You're not going to find that in the after action report. You're going to find that in the correspondence. What happened beforehand? What were the orders that were going out? What did they want to do? And it's all right there in black and white. But uh, sometimes it gets ignored because we have these underlying assumptions of what, of what a commander was trying to do. We don't need to know what he said. He was trying to do. We know what he was trying to do. If we don't know what he's trying to do, we know what he should have been trying to do, right? Give you an example, because I know a lot of you people raise your hand for Tatum, right? And about how sometimes it's inexplicable because it does not conform to your expectation. It's inexplicable that McClellan sent First Corps over across the creek on the 16th, right? The evening of the 16th. He did do that, right? Right? Inexplicable, because how can you surprise anybody if you go over the night before? What's the underlying assumption? He wanted to surprise him. You've seen those Frankenstein movies when you were a kid? I'm old enough that I remember it was Saturday afternoon, right? Frankenstein, the Wolfman, all that stuff. Frankenstein is some girl through the woods. He's moving like this. The girl's going like this. And then she trips over a root and sprains her ankle or whatever. Basically, the only way anybody was going to be surprised at this point is if they wanted to be surprised and if they were walking backwards. Same thing with, uh, same thing with um, uh, First Bull Run. But we assume, because when we watch TV, we watch a war movie, everybody wants to surprise everybody. Sometimes surprise isn't what they're wanting to do. In the case of Antietam, maybe what he wanted to do Maybe what McClellan wanted Lee to do was expose and develop his artillery line so that he could deal with that artillery before the infantry went into action. Did that happen? 
to some degree, right? He did. He, developed, he brought that whole artillery out. Beautiful enfilade position to uh, where McClellan was over there at the Pry House. He was at the Pry House by that time, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, we can find out what McClellan wanted to do because he told us what he did. It's right in that book right there. Now, you can also um, read a lot of this stuff in a nice summary in this book here because everybody usually asks me, what's the one book I want to get on the first bull run? So I tell them the one book you want to get on the first bull run. The beauty of it is it's not very expensive. It's beautifully written, and it's short. And you don't have to read about Fort Sumter, the bombardment of Fort Sumter in there, and, and all that other stuff that you... You have to, uh, is it the far west or the far of the west? Which one went to Fort Sumter? Star of the West. Star of the West. Far west was, uh, I also studied uh, the Little Bighorn. Far west was, was that boat that was built where? Where was the far west? You know? Pittsburgh, PA. Pittsburgh, PA. I'm from Pittsburgh. You know that. Okay. Now, where are we? Um, okay. I'm going to cut a little more stuff out and go right here. I'm going to go right here. Who is that man? What's that? What, what? Princess, Princess Bride. Bride, right? One of the great movies of all time. Because it also had the major of the 54th Massachusetts in it. Was, he, he was the dread pirate Roberts, pirate Roberts in that movie. This character's name is Vizzini. Vizzini. Okay. Now, Vizzini's character... He had captured Buttercup, Princess Buttercup, and um, they were running off towards, I can't remember, the, Gilder, I think was the name of the place. And um, the Dread Pirate Roberts, who was actually Wesley, in, uh, was following them. And he kept catching up. And every time that they weren't putting more distance between themselves and Wesley, he would say that's inconceivable. Every time anything happened that he didn't expect to happen, he inconceivable until finally Ennio Montoya said to him I don't think that word means what you, you keep using that word I don't think it means what you think what you think it means right and I just you, you're just gonna every time you the word inexplicable when you read Civil War history just think of inconceivable why is it inexplicable the reason it's inexplicable because it does not conform to my thoughts of what it, what they should have been doing and therefore, it's inexplicable. But when you dig deeper, you're often going to find a splick for it, for lack of a better word. Okay? Um, also got, anybody know who that is? Now nah, you're not going to know. This fellow's name is Johnny Casper. He's from a wonderful movie named Mil called Miller's Crossing, right? And in that film, he has a great quote. His, his, his job is fixing fights. That's how he makes money. He fixes fights. He knows how the fight's going to turn out. He lays his money where it's supposed to be. N nobody else knows how it's going to turn out. Right? He says, it's getting so the businessman can't expect no return from a fixed fight because somebody's been giving away the fix. Now, if you can't trust a fix, who can you trust? For a good return, you've got to go betting on chance. And then you're back with anarchy right back in the jungle. We just got to let things fall where they will, right? And um, you probably all run across this before where, where you've read a history or whatever, and everything's based on what that author thinks should have happened, his assumptions on what should have happened, and then they back into it. Most of the psych, psycho pop type explanations of why a commander did what he did are based on stuff like that. Okay, if I say that he had a problem with his mother as a child, I can, I can, I can make that the reason that he did this, right? Uh, there's the famous one with, with Mary Chestnut talking about Joe Johnson not shooting any pheasants because he had such a good reputation for shooting pheasants, he didn't want to, he didn't want to not live up to it. Now, what you don't know if you didn't read the introduction to Mary Chestnut's book is it's not really a journal. <laughs> She wrote a lot of that later on. Otherwise, she should have been president. 
because she knew everything that was going to happen before it happened. All right, so that's Johnny Casper, and I, 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 I say that it's intellectually dishonest, dishonest to fix a conclusion, and it happened in Civil War history, and all, all history too, but because I focus so much on the Civil War history, um, and that's a problem too. Who reads a lot of Civil War? I mean, a lot, like most of you are reading a Civil War, right? So you can't pick up a popular history. I'll give you an example. If you've read a whole lot, any of you pick up Chernow's Grant book? Any, how many of you didn't finish it? Right? Right? Because it was based on a lot of centennialist uh, Civil War, was it not? I mean, that's the way I read it. E.J. Stiles' biography of Custer was the same way. They're fine books. They're great. They're great writers and everything else. But uh, uh, level learning that we could get kind of spoils us. Um, for that standpoint, we get our stomach does that thing when you read something what you have learned after 20, 30 years of, of reading about this stuff. That's like we all start out reading, reading Catton and Foote and, and Freeman, and then we spend the rest of our life unlearning Catton and Foote and Fre Freeman, although they're great, great writers. And the last character I'm going to have, anybody, <laughs> if anybody knows who that is, I'll be shocked. This is from a film called Fight Club. Okay, this character's name is Tyler Durden. This guy, I don't think he ever did have a name. I'm not going to give away the end of the story. But anyway, what Tyler's doing here at this time is he poured lie into, uh, I'll call him the narrator's um, and he won't let him wipe it off. He says, because before you can do anything, you have to, you have to lose everything. So what we have to do, like I just described, we kind of have to unlearn a lot of the stuff we've already learned, especially, in my opinion, the first battle bull run. And again, this is my opinion. You might not be convinced by the time we get done. Um, but that's your fault, not mine. Uh, okay, so I've got a, a few slides here just to talk about uh, the guy who devised the plan. And this is a Brigadier General, and he was a full Brigadier General in the U.S. Army at that point, Irvin McDowell. Irvin McDowell. Looking kind of svelte over there. Because usually... You never read the word McDowell, the word portly before it, which I find personally offensive. <laughs> okay, but that's, that's Irvin right there. Um, talk a little bit about him. He is like almost every other uh, federal general at this time from Ohio. This was his house on Spring Street in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he's a West Pointer, um, but he had spent his whole career on staff. He'd never commanded uh, troops in battle. Um, his mother was a cousin of, was it Senator Cass? Cass, right? Abolitionist, I think, from Michigan, was he not? And this is something I just put together yesterday in my head. Cass had a town and a county in Georgia named after him. Cass County and the town of Cassville, which uh, there's other Civil War associations with. But anyway, after the Battle of Bull Run, uh, Cassville decided, and, and the county people decided, we don't want to have our county and our town named after a Yankee abolitionist anymore. So they changed the name of the county, and this was after First Bull Run, they changed it to Bartow County, because Colonel Bartow uh, of uh, Georgia was martyred at first, although he wasn't from where Cassville is. They also decided they're going to change their uh, town name because it was Cassville. So what did they change that to? Anybody want to guess? Manassas. Changed it to Manassas. Uh, so today, still, the um, county is Bartow because, you know, your state county members can change it whatever they want. But... Your post office can't be changed from what the U.S. Postal Service said can be changed to. So they said, no, you're still Cassville. You're not Manassas. So it's still Cassville today in Bartow County. Uh, but anyway, that was a, a Irvin McDowell's mother's cousin. Uh, and it, it's a small world. It's a really small world. One thing you, you learn looking at all this stuff. Um, he had a brother, John McDowell. I, I told a story yesterday that was wrong. John McDowell, if he 
to Shiloh, you've seen the McDowell Monument, which is the only McDowell Monument. Right? It's one of those uh, uh, camp pyramids, right? Like McDowell, who was actually on his staff at Bull Run, very difficult to research him online because you're just going to get that guy that was in a clockwork orange all the time, Malcolm McDowell, and Blue Thunder. He was the bad guy in Blue Thunder and a lot of other movies. Uh, he met Helen of Troy, Helen Burden of Troy, in uh, 1844. Uh, he's a West Point class of 1838. He graduated 23 of 45. He's made a brevet second lieutenant, like all graduates of West Point, when they graduated a brevet second lieutenant until a billet opened and they could move up. Um, uh, so he uh, was in the first artillery, so you know he was in that second tier of West Pointers because the first tier is engineers, second's ordnance, third's artillery, fourth is infantry, and the last is, is uh, cavalry because yeah. Um, but they're all engineers. That's what I always love when they say, oh no, he was an engineer. Oh, they're all engineers. The only thing you can major in at West Point was called a major because you just went there because you were going to become an engineer. Um, let's see. He uh, instructed at the military academy for four years. He was the aide school in the Mexican War. He received a brevet to captain, uh, a brevet major, and appointed brigadier general of the United States Army in May of 1861, All right? So what's the most important thing to a soldier in the antebellum army? An officer in the antebellum army. What is the most important thing? What's that? Rank, right? Rank and seniority, right? So he went from, uh, he went to brigadier general from what? First lieutenant. Now, how many people did that piss off, do you think? All of them. All of them weren't happy about it. So the story goes that this was a serendipitous kind of uh, uh, promotion in charge of the forces being assembled at Washington. Um, now, this is more of his, of his story, uh, what happens to him. You know, he doesn't do the first bull run, doesn't do the second bull run. Out west, on the stump for Lincoln in 1864. Uh, eventually, uh, has some commands out there in the west and um, dies in 1885 after he was the the uh, parks commissioner in uh, San Francisco. So, like I said that the guys he was he was Ron Swanson in San Francisco in the 1880s. Uh, he died in San Francisco. He's buried at the National Cemetery at the, at the Presidio out there in uh, San Francisco. It's more than one Presidio. It happens to be the one in, in San Francisco. And here's his tombstone. Read it closely. What do you see? What's that? Major General who? Irwin. Irwin. That's not his name. It's Irvin. Yeah. I hope they never change it. I hope they always like it. Uh, it's a pretty simple marker, right? It's no Dan Butterfield marker or uh, uh, Abner Doubleday marker. It's your basic veterans marker in the Presidio. A um, couple uh, more things about him. I told you his, his letters assumed to be destroyed, you know, kind of like uh, George Thomas, his wife, famously destroyed all of his correspondence. He was granted to view the papers, but uh, that, grant, that permission was later rescinded. So the implication are that they exist. And the 10 letters that we do have came from someplace. Came from someplace. So I believe they're still around. Maybe they're in files in San Francisco. Uh, James Garfield uh, was a big McDowell fan. Um, and uh, his son's Irvin McDowell Garfield, his last son, I believe. Could they be in Garfield in, um, in Ohio? Who knows? I haven't been over there. I've as I can go through there. So typically his appointment is thought to be serendipitous. Okay. Scott wasn't Scott's idea. And we just got to reach down to see 
staff. Here's a guy who's never led a single person in battle in his life, and we're going to put him in charge of this army. Sal's army was uh, involved in politics in, in both Ohio and prior to that, Kentucky. And his father was the mayor of uh, Columbus at one time. Who was else was from Columbus? Salmon Chase. At this time of the war, he was being referred to as General Chase because everybody thought Seward, Cameron, all thought they could basically do uh, the job of Secretary of War, War Secretary. They call it Secretary of Defense now, but it was called War Secretary back then. Um, but McDowell, later on, he was intimately involved in the planning of the wedding of Kate Chase and William Sprague. Some say William Sprague won the most prestigious battle of the Civil War by landing Kate Chase. Um, and so the serendipitous nature of his appointment probably isn't quite right. There's probably a little bit more to it than that. But long and short of it, he was placed in command of the army, of the forces being assembled at, uh, at um, Washington that would forever remain nameless. An army never had a name. So another one of the myths is that the uh, Confederate Army was, one of the Confederate armies is called the Army of the Potomac. That's true. And that the Union Army was the Army of Northeastern Virginia. That's false. McDowell uh, was in command of the department, I think Department of uh, Northeastern Virginia, but there was never a army formed and dubbed um, the uh, Army of Northeastern Virginia. And to boot, if you go through the ORs, you won't see that name, except on, I found on one report, and I think that's in the supplement. Oh no, one report in there that uh, was division, temporary division commander, uh, Porter, uh, placed on endorsement of um, Ambrose Burnside's after action report which wasn't filed until after said army no longer existed and had come under the command of George McClellan. So no, there never was one of those. It's always referred to either McDowell's Army, McDowell's Corps sometimes, but never the Army of Northeastern Virginia. Now we're going to talk about the plan. One thing we know about the plan is this. Everybody's got one. They get punched in the mouth. Civil War historian Mike Tyson said that. In one, I think it was in his, his doctoral thesis from. Uh, <laughs> they changed it. It used to be. It used to be called that. Um, okay. So one thing we can't know, though, is what did what did Lincoln want out of this campaign? What did he want? Did he want to go in and crush and kill as many Confederates as he could? This is the, uh, the U.S. Marine Corps approach. Break things and kill people, right? Or what else might he have wanted to do? Did he want his wayward sisters to come home? Did he want to demonstrate that we have such overwhelming resources that you don't want to put up a fight? Did he really want to kill people? That's the question. We don't know. We don't know what, he, what if any conversation between him and Scott, or him and McDowell, or him and Scott and McDowell, about this is what we want to accomplish in this campaign. All right, we don't know what that was. Uh, we know that the Confederates had set up a, a line of defense along uh, the line of Bull Run, although they weren't all behind it. There were some further forward up to Fairfax, uh, towards Germantown in that area up there, Centerville. Um, but the, they were forward positions. The actual the actual line was along first bull, uh, a long run, what sometimes people call a creek. I gotta take my jacket off. Sometimes people call a creek and, and they, the people at the park get all really upset. When they call it a creek, it's a run. It's called bull run. I don't know the difference between a creek and a run. Um, like I said, I also studied first bull run and I don't know the difference between a coulee and a ravine. And I asked a former superintendent of of uh, the, the Little Bighorn Battlefield, what the difference was, and he said, I don't know what the difference is. 
But anyway, it's, it's a run. So everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So let's talk about the plan. As popular related, this is a story you know. And is it, we have to ask ourselves, based on facts, not in evidence. We know, because we've read, three of you have read Bill Davis's, uh, Jack Davis's book, right? It's a speedy flank attack, is what he wanted to do, to defeat an outnumbered enemy in a single grand victory. Does that conform to what you know about First Battle of Bull Run? We're trying to do, right? Okay. Also, that plan required that Patterson, General Patterson, holds Joe John in the Shenandoah Valley so that those forces can't join and I retain my numerical advantage. Sound right? Okay. Uh, uh, another myth about Patterson is we know he's old, right? He's like my age. Um, we know he's old, and we know he's an old time regular army guy, right? Old time regular army guy, a total of four years in the United States Army, two in the War of 1812 in Mexico. Right. He's a Pennsylvania militia man and a politico and a very, very rich guy. All right. He was not regular army. But anyway, we know, because McDowell said so in the joint study of the conduct, uh, that stuff, that um, he said, my whole plan was based on, you've got to hold him there. And everything was going fine until he got there. So whose fault is it? Of course. It's Patterson's fault. Uh, because, you know, I had to maintain my numerical superiority that I planned on. So what are the elements of these operations? What are, these are basic things. One thing I know is when I start using terms like this, uh, a military person, if I, if I get one to agree, the other one will disagree. That's not what it means. Basics, of what's the definition of strategy and what's the definition of tactics? You're always going to be wrong with these guys. You know, just the important thing to remember is, the five, you know, the five paragraph order, what they called, they go by the initials or something. Yeah, but there, there's, there's five things. They take the letters they start Smeak. with. Smeak? Is that, yeah. Didn't exist then, right? I love it when people break things down back then and says, okay, let's look at the Smeak on this. They didn't even have it. I mean, Emory Upton hadn't even, they haven't even come up with the uh, uh, staff college yet. The Prussians didn't even come up with it yet. They came up with it first. Uh, but anyway, this is just something I come up with. Something you have, things that you have to consider when you're uh, setting a plan of operations. What are the force sizes? What do I have? What do they have? What's the topography that I'm going to be moving over? What's my objective? How am I going to achieve it? Does that make sense? It's kind of all-encompassing, right? If you don't know any of those things, you're in trouble. So here's plan about opposing force. And this came out about June 24th. June 24th. We can't keep this a secret. Five miles from Washington. We can't keep it a secret. All right? So think about that when you're thinking about the element of surprise. Uh, when it becomes known positively, we're about to march, and they have much strength, because they will, call in their disposal forces from all quarters. One of the interesting things I find, I go through all the newspapers, right? Newspaper by newspaper uh, on newspaper.com. And uh, the Washington and Baltimore newspapers were almost doing time broadcasts of the forces as they moved out of Washington. What roads they were on, who was on what road, people, okay? So he's right about that. I think they will not be able to bring more than 10,000 men. I don't think they're going to have more than 10,000 men come up. I know they've got 25,000 there right now. I think they can bring up 10,000. That's from all other excluding the valley. So I think we must calculate on having to do with about 35,000 men. We're going to have to deal with 35,000 men. I propose to move against Manassas with a force of 30,000 of all arms, organized into three columns with a reserve of 10,000. 
So what's that say about that? I plan on swiftly overwhelming the line at Manassas. I 35,000 men with 30,000 men. Mm-hmm. With a reserve of ten thousand. Yeah, they're not going. He's not going to bring into play. Does that mean he's got forty thousand total? He actually ends up with like thirty-five, but that was his plan. Yeah. Yep. So he's basically saying that he's at odds. He's going up with the one-to-one ratio. A little less than one-to-one. And the military will get the attack. You want to have three times as many? Three to one. I don't know that any I've ever seen a plan conceived with that notion. You know, that's that's the saw, three to one, right? But I don't think I've ever, you know, like they say, you know, you never divide your, you know, divided forces in the face of the enemy. A chance for never been done before. Well, read a little bit about Napoleon. Yeah, it's done all the time. We have a lot of myths about the Civil War that we like to think of our own, like never moved troops by rail before first, minutes, unless you were in the Crimea. Uh, never mind. A, you never mind a, a Confederate. I mean, a, an enemy position, and blew it up underneath until um, the crater. Unless you go back to Vicksburg, unless you go back to Henry the Fourth, Henry the Fifth. Any thespians there? Once more unto the breach, right? What was the breach created by? A mine, designed by a Welshman. Believe it or not. Okay, so anyway, he didn't expect to overwhelm anybody. Whose staff was he on all those years? Scott's. He was on Scott's staff all those years. What's Scott do in Mexico? He didn't have overwhelming numbers. He used a certain maneuver or move or operational plan all, all through Mexico, same as Lee Lee did. We'll talk about it in a minute. But anyway, doesn't plan on that. What's his objective point? Manassas Junction, because that's where all those rail lines meet, and you can get food from Shenandoah Valley down to Richmond and the rest of the Confederacy. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to do that, because we want to take control of Northern Virginia, correct? And again, this is about June 24th. I propose to attack the main position by turning it, if possible. So it's to cut off communications by rail with the south. Threatened to do so, sufficient for the enemy to leave his entrenchment to guard them, if necessary. And I find it can be done with safety. I'll go to Bristow and destroy the bridge at that place. What does this plan sound like? like? I want to crush the enemy, see them driven before me, and hear the lamentations of their women. It doesn't sound like that at all. It sounds like he wants to take control of northern Virginia, doesn't it? Right? What's communications? Okay. Expectation, believing the chances are greatly in favor of the enemies accepting battle between this and the junction. You know, greatly in favor. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn their position. And we're going to get into that. How much time do I have? Two hours yet? We're going to get into that. Uh, these are three things he, he said, that, and I'm, I'm not going to pardon any commander if these things happen to him. You can't come up upon a battery or breastwork without a knowledge of its position. This is not an inordinate fear of mass batteries as has been pre- presented. Uh, I don't want you to be surprised. He's basically saying the same thing over again. And if you are surprised, I don't want you falling back. Advanced guards with vedettes well in front and flankers with vil- vigilance will guard against the first and second. So why are you moving so slow? Why are you so worried? One of the reasons they're so worried about being surprised is he, if you look at the order of battle on my website, as soon as you get home tonight and every day for the rest of your lives, <laughs> um, you will find all these different cavalry companies for the Confederates. And you'll find six companies of regular cavalry for the Union. Like six. Thomas, who was in the valley with Patterson. Um, they weren't being used for this type of stuff. Infantry units were mostly volunteering, mostly brand new 
soldiers who had never been in action before, or even on the march before, or maybe even slept outside before. Okay, so he knows, he says you got to go with caution. You got to be got to be real careful about what you're doing out there. And that was on the 16th. He wrote that. This is all before the battle. <clears throat> what do you know? About he's going to consider. He's going to turn that Confederate position from its right, which was down around Union Mills Ford, where Ewell was. Um, so he went to Colonel Heinzelman's division, which was the southernmost uh, column, uh, to make arrangements to turn the enemy's right and, I, and intercept his communications with the down there, didn't take anybody with him, because his chief engineer thought it was beneath him to go. He's going to see the 18th of Ford, where he thought all the action was going to be. Uh, his name was uh, uh, Bernard, right? The guy who designed the uh, defenses of Washington and who wasn't real happy about McDowell being promoted over him because he ranked McDowell when McDowell was first lieutenant. Um, so he goes down and he finds that the ground is no good for that. Okay? Uh, he's writing this spot. So I abandoned that plan of turning its right and decided I'm going to turn his left because where can you where can you turn a line from there's only two spots the left or the right right is that Brian hey how you doing sorry Brian Downey if, uh, if you don't know him but I, I'll tell I'll tell you later uh, we'll talk later um, anyway and it's another one of the myths because on the 18th there was this fight at Black Ford, right? You have all heard of that? And the story is, oh, the failure of this attempt on the, on the Confederate center forced McDowell to decide to go to the, to the Confederate left, right? Well, McDowell always intended on turning the position. You don't turn a position from the center. So he never really considered that. Was he upset that... Uh, um, General Tyler, uh, Daniel Tyler, uh, brought on that engagement that he was. But it wasn't an overwhelming defeat. It didn't demoralize the, the Union Army. And it didn't affect one iota of uh, what McDowell wanted to do. And this is me saying that as an absolute. This is all my opinion, right? If you want to stick with the old story, it's OK to be wrong. Um, so he decides I'm going to go and turn the Confederate left instead of their right. And that left was where? All right, Stone Bridge. How many have been to Manassas? How far away do you guys live from Manassas and you haven't been there? What's up with you guys? It's Virginia. Oh, is that it? Okay. All right, I got it then. That makes sense. <laughs> That's it. That, that sign that says Virginia 30 miles is like the only sign of life in Maryland. Is that it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, he decides I'm going, to, I'm going to turn their left, which is up around Stonebridge, and that's where um, General Evans with his Demi Brigade was. So he decides he's going to do some reconnaissance. And the object of that reconnaissance, he, he says on the 20th, or the 21st, he said the author of that reconnaissance was to find a point might be bridge and forded, so to turn these places where the enemy are prepared for us. He made five uh, efforts, and they hadn't been successful. Five efforts. A lot of woods up there, a lot of wine. Uh, and, and one map that was put in Harper's Weekly that shows the Warrington Turnpike going straight to. Where's the Warrington Turnpike go? You would think, but no, and that, it goes to Manassas. And that's not where it goes. Um, so he tries five times. And then finally, I think, hey, I'm going to make a, a reconnaissance in force. But I defer to the better judgment of others. It would be Tyler and, and, and Bernard and those guys. Uh, to try and get it by observation and stealth. And today, I propose to drive in the enemy and get the information required, which he does not. I'm told they obtained their supply of water from this stream. We'll run. If so, and we can get possession of that right bank, we shall force them to leave the now strong position of Manasseh. That's what he thinks can happen. This is on the 20th. 
then he's got to revise that expectation of the opposing forces because there's rumors that Johnson has joined Beauregard. They could hear trains up everywhere. Although a lot of, uh, uh, Jackson was already there by the 20th. Um, B and Bartow got there by the 20th. The only troops that arrived on the 21st were Hampton's Legion and Edmund Kirby Smith and, and uh, who's that Maryland or what's his name? Elsie, right? Arnold Elsie. Uh, some of those guys, the, the 1st Maryland Battalion, uh, they're the only ones that actually showed up on the 21st. Most of them had already been there by the 21st. Uh, most of Johnson's of, of, uh, of, uh, forces that made it in time, because there were some that never did make it in time. So he has to make a, a, a did he make a, an opposing force revision? We don't know. But we do know that he had heard rumors that Johnson had joined Beauregard. So now, Here's his objective restatement. We're going to turn the position, force the enemy from the road, Warrington Turnpike, Lee Highway, 29 today. Uh, better than no 29, because I can't imagine it's going to stay the Lee Highway much longer. Uh, that it may be reopened, and if possible, destroy the railroad leading from Manassas to the Valley of Virginia. The enemy has a large force. So I want to get on the enemy's communications. Cut that line. He did see that as a less decisive uh, move than that around the right to, to Manassas Junction itself. So he's probably talking about cutting the rail line at Groveton, which is a little further west of the battlefield. It's out there where the uh, Manassas Monument is, if you've ever been out there. All right, and that's on the 20th he's writing that. So he's going to tell you what we're going to do. First Division is going to stay basically in front of the Stone Bridge. And he's going to threaten passage, but won't do anything. And we'll open fire at daybreak, and that's Peter Conover Haynes' 30-pounder parrot. They'll open, up, open the ball at about 6, 6.30. The second division will move from its camp at 2 a.m. precisely. He's further behind. So Tyler's got to move first. Second division will move next. That's Hunter. Uh, after they pass Cub Run, they're going to go north through the woods, narrow roads through the woods up to Sudley Springs, and then he's going to turn on to uh, turn south once he gets across that um, springs. Actually, there's two crossings there because there's two streams there. Today it's known as Bull Run and, and Little Bull Run, I think, uh, but at the time the second stream was known as Cat Harpen Run. Cat Harpen Run. That's how they pronounce it there. I don't know, down around Chancellorsville, they may, may say Catharpen. But in Manassas, it's Cat Harpen, Cat Harpen Run. So there's, there's actually two crossings, but they're real close together. And then they're going to turn down to the left, descend the stream, and clear away the enemy who may be guarding the lower Ford and Bridge. It will then bear off to the right and make room for second division that's going to cross the stream further down, not so far. That second division is the third division, Heinzelman. So I'll show you on a map what that's going to look like. Okay, so they're going to be behind them and then join them and continue down to Pike. The 5th Division is just going to stay there uh, by Blackburn's Ford. That's Miles. Is held there too, although it's to Tyler. And they were supposed to demonstrate at Blackburn's Ford, but strangely enough, you know what they did? First thing they did? They constructed, depending on your pronunciation, Abatis or Abati. All right. So if you see a guy on the side of a creek from you putting up a bunch of barricades, are you thinking he's going to attack you? Probably not. But anyway, that's exactly what they did. Here's a map showing you what I just described. Okay. Uh, here's my pointer here. Here's Cub Run. Okay. So Hunter's going to move and he's going to go up this way. And then back down. And, and this is where it gets interesting, is because McDowell says, you're going to move along the stream. Look at this. Simple as it sounds, because he probably didn't have a good map. They did not have good maps, even though it was 20, 25 miles away from Washington. Uh, they didn't have really good maps. They got really good maps right after this. One of the things McDowell uh, and Bernard worked on. 
Um, and then after, oops, sorry, uh, you'll see Heintzelman's going to come here, and he's going to cut across here at this place, Poplar Ford, basically. All right, and then it's going to be a right, the way we're looking at it, uh, an east to west development of that line down towards the turnpike. Down towards the turnpike. All right, that's the way it was to happen. Uh, and it, sir, McDowell's plan goes to the Warrington Turnpike and doesn't go anywhere else. So any other uh, assumptions about what McDowell was supposed to do after he got to the Warrington Turnpike is what can All righty. Writers tend to use these terms, flank versus turn. They tend to use them interchangeably. Well, how that's been, ha that's been done. In Military Memoirs of a Confederate, who's read that? Somebody just won it tonight. Yeah? Military Memoirs? Okay, because that's not what usually gets won. <laughs> this is an old book written for publication. Military Memoirs of a Confederate by e. P., the infallible E.P. Alexander, to some people. He talks about the message that he sent to Evans from Signal Hill down closer to Manassas when he started uh, moving around the, uh, the left of the Confederate position. He could see the, he could see the um, glint of bayonets and of, of the guns. By guns, I mean cannons. It says, look out, you are turned. And if you look at Signal Hill now and you look at the monument that's there, um, that's what it says. Look out for your left, you are turned. You read any of... Uh, Bull Run prior to 1989 um, that refers to this message, it's going to say, look out for your left, you are turned. Sadly, in 1989, there was a publication of another book called Fighting for the Confederacy, which I'm sure far more of you have read than Military Memoirs of the Confederate. Who's read Fighting for the Confederacy? Edited by Gary Gallagher, right? Not intended for publication. Not intended for pu publication. And in that book, um, Alexander says, I said, look out for the left, you are flanked. I highly doubt he said you are flanked. Because you are flanked, and what you are starts with the same letter. Okay? And he was at that point. He was turned, though. And we'll talk about the difference between the two terms here in a second. Monument, like I said. Look out for your left, you are turned. Because he was turned. He was turned. Now, a lot of you are sitting here, what's the difference? We're going to talk about that. To, use, to, to illustrate that, um, I'm going to refer to uh, this book. You may have read, read, read Confederate Rising by Joe Harsh. You probably have had Dr. Harsh in, uh, long ago here to speak, I'd imagine. Um, now, I know what you're going to say. Um, McDowell could not have read this book. That's true. I'll get to that in a second. But he does a really good job explaining the difference between a flank and a turn. When you read Harsh, he says, in this maneuver, a turning movement, a commander sends all or part of his army on a wide sweep around the enemy to threaten a point so vital, the enemy has to respond to the danger. When it's successfully executed, uh, the turning movement compelled the foe to abandon a prepared position which entrenched not, had been carefully selected for its topographical strength, which really describes the line of bull run, right? When it's done correctly. But you have to think of this not as a tactic and not as a strategy so much as more of a grand tactic, an operational move. It's a, it's a, it's a high thinking move. It's not a, it's not a move that uh, captains or colonels would even think about, right? They think about a flank all the time. I got to get on the end of that guy's line, right? They're not thinking about a turning movement. Um, so it can be a, a employed to three ends. Uh, it might be to compel the enemy to treat, retreat and thereby forfeit uh, whatever territory he's got. And that could be virtually bloodless like Tullahoma, right? Um, it certainly offered the best prospect for easy fighting. Uh, in another version, the object of the operation could be to seize and hold a threatening position and thus force the enemy 
to attack you. Okay? And this option offered the advantages of the tactical defense. In the third form, commander would want to retain the initiative by doing the attacking himself. His object would be to render the enemy vulnerable to deliver the killing blow. So you can see this in a lot of uh, You can see this all with Scott in Mexico. You can see this in everything Robert E. Lee did. And you can see this at Chancellorsville with Joe Hooker, where he only really talked about two of the options. Uh, his, his, uh, his response is to fight me where he or ignominiously, was that the word? Flee. Right? And he thought he was fleeing. And Sickles thought he was fleeing. And, uh, as a result, we have what happened at the uh, first day at Chancellorsville, right? Um, it could be that you know, if he chose a position that um, was uh, uh, advantageous to me, back him there. Okay. Three things could happen. Uh, after the opposing became, uh, after the armies became uh, entangled and strategy gave way to tactics, commander had but two ways to retain the initiative without making a final assault. How many times in what I showed you before the McDowell said he didn't want to make a final assault? A lot. Okay. Um, he could break off the engagement, withdraw to start a new turning movement, turn him again. This is something else that uh, Lee did quite a bit. What do he do after 2nd Manassas? Turn him again, right? What do he do after Chancellorsville? Turned again. Turned again. You know, if I, if I on the flank, flank attack, you think about Chancellorsville. You think about Jackson at Chancellorsville. What do you need to do? He need to show up on that buddy no. Okay. You think about a turn, I want somebody to leave his position. What good is it going to be for me to show up somewhere where he doesn't know I'm going to show up? I want him to leave. In order for him to leave, he's got to know I'm coming, right? OK. Um, at its most basic operation, uh, at its most basic, the flank uh, involved nothing more complicating than attacking the enemy line on the side or in rear at a point where it was unprepared for an assault. The uh, enemy could obligingly present his own flank, like Pope did at Bull Run 2. Uh, but ordinarily, a flanking column marched in a narrow arc to a point where the enemy was vulnerable. That's Jackson at Chancellorsville. Okay, so a flank attack could be part of your turning movement, but not the turning movement. Although sometimes confused in identification, the turning movement and the flank attack have important differences. Turning, move, turning movement's a strategic maneuver. Might end successfully in all those different ways we we uh, described. But once the turning operation was launched, secrecy was not only unnecessary, but self-defeating. Enemy needed to know a vital point was threatened, threatened in order to come out into the open and be attacked or attack or retreat. Flank attack was a tactical operation, which when successful, always ended in battle. It needed to be concealed from the enemy until the moment the attack was launched. Very different from the turning movement or turning maneuvers sometimes. Anyway, if you haven't read Confederate Tide Riding, Rising, read it, and then follow it up with taking it to flood. Now, I said that, of course, McDowell could not have read Joe Harsh. But he could read this guy, Ant uh, Baron. Uh, what is his whole name? Sometimes I forget. Did I write it down anywhere? I didn't, but it's, it's got more than that in it. Antoine Henri. I always used to say hominy, but uh, a lot of people Jomini, with they pronounce the J. Especially, he's, he's this guy, he's this Swiss guy that spent like three years on Napoleon's staff and the rest of his life writing about it. Um, some people thought he was a bag of hot air. He wrote this book, The Art of War. How many have read that? How many stayed awake? <laughs> what a slog that was. And this was a textbook. This is actually a copy of the textbook that was used at West Point. Okay, and they read about this stuff um, at West Point. How many of them read about it after they left West Point? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but you can read about the influence that this book did not have on uh, the army uh, with a sword in one hand and Jamin in the other. 
It was a saying they had how these volunteer uh, generals went into battle and they had their sword and their jomini in one hand. And, and it, it dispels a lot of those myths, actually. Um, it's a very good book. And um, Carol gives me $100 every time I do this program. <laughs> so what they say, because this is what, this is what um, Thou would have heard. He says, I by no means intend to discourage the use of the turning movement. On the contrary, I'm a constant advocate of it. It's very important to know how to use it skillfully and opportunely, and I am moreover of the opinion this is where it really applies to first bull run. If it be a general's design to make himself master of the enemy's communications while at the same time holding his own, because remember what he wanted to do, once he got down to the Warrington Turnpike, open up his line of communications back across Stone Bridge to Tyler's division, right? I, di I didn't read all that, but it was up there, okay? Uh, he would be better to employ strategic and tactical combinations to Okay, so he's saying, if that's what you want to do, you want to use a turn movement. You don't want to use some uh, tactical combination, tactical movement being a flank attack, among other things, not just flank attack. Frontal attacks are also which we know McDowell did not want to do. McDowell's plans never addressed what was to happen after establishing his line along the Warrington Turnpike and back across Bull Run. That's as far as they go. You find something else that goes further than that that wasn't written after the battle, send it to me. I'd love to see it. Okay? Uh, his plans and actions leading up to and during the attack better indicate a strategic turning movement flank attack. So we get back into those splicables and inexplicables, conceivable and inconceivable, right? Um, so let's take a look at these inexplicables. And I'm, I'm wrapping up now. How time did I start? Yeah, it got to be 20 after 7, right? Almost 7.30. All right, if what we think we know, we talked about what we thought we knew, were true. Once McDowell got to Centerville, he stayed there for two days. Remember, he got there on the 18th. They fought a little fight there at Blackburn's Ford, and he didn't take off uh, against the Confederate line at, uh, at Bull Run until the 20th. It did take him two days to move after he got to Centerville. Why did the Army sit still for two day, full days? I'm sorry, the first part was just to get to Centerville in two days. They left the 16th. They got there the 18th, not 20 miles. After that, two more days. Who are you going to surprise after you've been sitting there, after you left Washington 25 miles away four days ago? All right. Why did Richardson construct a base on this front if he was supposed to be threatening the center? Why was the first threatening action made on the extreme left of the Confederate line? That's Stone Bridge. That's the extreme left. I showed you where they actually went far north of that. Okay? So if, uh, you know, if he wanted to surprise him and all that, why would the first threatening action be made on the extreme left of where, if you were doing a flank attack, that's where you wanted to do it. You already ruled out the right. Okay? Why did the McDowell, now this is another story, once uh, the, the U did consolidate almost at Warrington Turnpike, around the area uh, just behind the stone there, um, although it never did establish itself back across Stone Bridge. Um, but why did McDowell, who's sitting there on Buck Hill, I think it's called, uh, screaming victory, victory, and waving his hat as he saw his line um, develop there along Warrington Turnpike? And he saw Sherman from uh, his division come onto the field. Well, what do you think? Oh, there's Sherman. He's with Tyler. Tyler's over on the bridge. Maybe we've established that line. So he's screaming victory. But he hadn't beaten anybody yet. He's only fought off B. Berto and, and, and Evans and some of Hampton's Legion at this point. That's all he's done. It's a good but very complex plan foiled by its slow movement, which cost the Union Army the element of surprise and allowed the Confederates to reinforce. That's why the plan failed. 
okay? That's what we know if we've watched uh, you know, the video at the park or whatever, okay, any of that stuff, okay? Cost the Union Army the element of surprise and allowed the Confederates to reinforce. And McDowell committed his forces piecemeal. Committed them piecemeal. He did on Henry Hill commit them piecemeal. He didn't on Matthews Hill. Burnside started off with a, with a, a, th a th three regiment um, battle line. Porter deployed his in, in a similar fashion over on uh, Dogan's Ridge. Okay, but at, on Henry Hill, sure enough, those units went in there one regiment at a time, especially Sherman later on. So here's what McDowell had to say about to the JCCW. I hold that I more than fulfilled my part of the compact because that's what generals have with the government. They have an agreement on how they're going about doing things. And if everything doesn't go my way, I'm, I'm free of any blame, right? Works in the military. But anyway, <laughs> I was victorious against Beauregard and 8,000 of Johnson's troops also. Up to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I had done all and more than all that I had promised or agreed to do. And it was this last straw that broke the people's back. If you can call 4,000 men a straw who came upon me from, from behind fresh, came upon me from behind fresh from the cars. Right. The only ones that were fresh from the cars at the point he's referring to is uh, Elsie um, Kirby Smith. That's, what he, that's who he's talking about. And even just them, uh, they also had uh, that bad old man with them. What was his name again? Jubal Early. Early. Was all that final, what they call the denouement, uh, John calls the denouement, Howard's denouement on Chin Ridge. That was the end of the fight. Um, and that's where they came in. But, you know, he had a ton of Beauregard's guys that really never got into the fight. Longstreet, his name during this, do you? Remember here, Longstreet, right? He never got into it. I mean, there was stuff going on down there, I'm not saying that, but this main uh, area of battle, he wasn't involved. Um, and the JCCW sums it all up. Principal cause of defeat on that day was the failure of General Patterson to hold the forces of Johnson in the Valley of Shenandoah. If you're looking at the reason for the defeat, that's one thing. Did that contribute to the defeat? Absolutely. Absolutely did. Because in the morning, Jackson, B, Bartow, they played a, a huge role in those Johnson's men. Okay? Failure of the plan? Well, how many men did McDowell think uh, was going to have? 35,000. How many did he have? 32, 34,000. Where do they come from? Make any difference when we're talking about the plan? Did it contribute to the defeat? Yes. Did it contribute to the failure of the plan? No. Because who cares where they came from? He expected that from you guys. Okay? Uh, why did his real plan fail? Well, there was a failure. Order of March, which was in the field to clear the pike from left to right the way they wanted to do it. Okay, remember I said they were good there. Uh, Hunter was going to go over first and he was going to move over and let Heinzelman fill in on his left. Right? Well, they weren't able to do that. Um, so they failed to uh, clear Stonebridge, which had a Betis on it and they thought was mined. Um, but um, Evans, when he went to meet uh, the Union forces on Matthews Hill, he left four companies of the 4th South Carolina and a, a gun, or two guns of Latham's battery, I believe, uh, down there by the bridge. They didn't do anything, but they kept um, Tyler from crossing the uh, bull run there, okay, where they actually crossed was up at Poplar Ford. Uh, so he never was able to establish that line all the way back across the run. All right, so that, that was definitely a failure in, of the plan. Uh, this resulted in a failure to cut the rail line at Groveton further out to the west, which he said he was going to do. Couldn't do that because he'd have to with his right, and where was his left, or the phrase for it. And he wasn't able to establish it across full run. So his left was 
in the air, okay? And there were, you remember, that left would have been near Bull Run and the rest of the Confederate Army was deployed further south and west along Bull Run. Um, and that resulted in McDowell choosing, after two hours, to do the one thing he said he wasn't gonna do, which was make a frontal attack uh, despite his repeated desire to not do so, it's an equal or superior force in a superior position. So when people ask me to explain the two-hour delay, I say, well, yeah, he's got them right where they want him. Okay? He has is, he is pushed back basically um, two brigades, essentially, of Confederates off of, McDow off of uh, Matthews Hill. You guys are going to have to get me to take you on a tour there, explain all this a lot better. Um, knows they, he knows they have 35,000 men, maybe more because he's heard the trains running all night long. So now he's got his line there, even if he's thinking, I am established back across um, Bull. Now what am I going to do? I fought basically, I don't know, 8,000 men something like that. All told, engaged on both sides, about 15,000 on each were engaged over there on that side of Bull Run. Not to say there wasn't anything elsewhere, but significant fighting. Um, so what's he got? A, he's, got a, he's got a quandary, right? They did exactly what they wanted them to do. But they didn't run away. They're not attacking me. And I look, they're up there on the top of this hill. What's a, they have a saying about high ground. It's like a good thing, right? Right? You know, like uh, John Buford said, there's good ground, John, or whatever it is they said. Uh, okay. So it resulted in him making that frontal attack. So let's think about these inexplicables. Why did it take two days to move to Central? He went in no rush. Right? He was in no rush. A strategic turning maneuver required and you be aware of your movement. He also assumed straight off that they would know he was coming. Remember he said that? They're going to know. I know everybody loves that story with Yule and the girl with the curls and the message pulled up in her hair saying that the, the, the Federals are leaving Washington. Right? We all like to, that's a great story. Right? Uh, uh, McDonald certainly was under the assumption that he's not going to surprise us. Why did it sit still for two full days? See, all these inexplicables, if you go back to the above, if you go back to the turning movement, which he said was what he wanted to do long, all these things aren't inexplicable anymore, are they? They're only inexplicable if you assume he wanted to move quickly and overwhelm with superior numbers. Then they're inexplicable. I admit that. But those assumptions are not in evidence. Like I said, um, why was the first threatening action made at the extreme left of the Confederate line? It's because that's what I say I'm here, right? Uh, why did he claim victory, victory? Well, because he thought he had established his line as he planned to. And why did he delay for up to two hours after that? Because he had no plan at all on what he was going to do after that. All that other planning he did was planning he was well suited to do in his role for 20 years in the Army, right? This is how we plan to do things. But then, what do you do once you get punched in the mouth? And he didn't know what to do once he got punched in the mouth. He tried something, and it didn't work. So, in summer, we come back to Vicini, right? Um, you think about inexplicable underlying assumptions. Just when you're reading about anything, think about that. When you hear it say, when you hear that, he inexplicably, he inexplicably did this. And then you got you to go back and start questioning what assumptions lead somebody to say that something is inexplicable. Um, now, am I right about McDowell's plan? I don't know if we're, we're, unless we find his papers somewhere where he actually addressed this stuff, because he did write his wife regularly. Uh, or maybe he's going to say, this is what I was trying to do. And the thing to note is that most histories of the battle assumptions that can't be supported with documentary evidence. Most historians assume McDonald's objectives, and, uh, 
but those assumptions aren't necessarily in evidence, and then that's what they're basing their judgment on, on what happened. I don't care if you agree with me, though. I'm not, I just kid, I kid when I say it's okay for you to be wrong, because you're not really wrong if you don't agree. I just care that you recognize the process that I'm using here, because I think it's a valuable process. I don't want to change the world. I just want to change the way people think about the first battle of Bull Run. Uh, at worst, it's dismissed and swallowed up by everything that comes before and after it. At best, uh, that plan, I think, is deeply misunderstood and misrepresented. Um, and if you think of uh, the words of uh, Johnny Casper, uh, don't work backwards. Uh, you know, every man is his own historian now or something, they say, right? And there's some sort of a, some sort of a saying like that these days, every man a historian or something like that. And we all do it. I mean, how many people are working on a book right now? I'm going to guess there's a few back here, right? Because every, everybody is. Because everybody can. And everybody should. If you're not working on a book, maybe you have a web project like me. Uh, I have a little bit of everything going on. But uh, just, you know, <clears throat> keep an open mind. You know, they say we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? I mean, Joe Harsh used to say everybody stands on Douglas Southall Freeman's shoulders. Well, you just can't assume that they were right about everything they wrote before. You have to, you have to break things down yourself. And as you get down into the details, and I'm sure some people, there's other people who have projects similar to mine, better than mine, um, that realize, you know, I got this little insignificant letter that's written, but there's this one sentence in it. It really makes me think. And maybe I find other letters or, or memoirs or communications that have similar sentences in them that really make me wonder, geez, am I thinking about this right, or are they trying to tell me something? And sometimes I really think they're trying to tell you something. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, what? We don't want to backload. You know, we don't want to start from an assumption and move backwards. And uh, we, don't want, we don't want to work with a fixed fight. Right? We, want to, we don't want everything to work at our conclusion. We want what we look at to lead us to a conclusion. And uh, finally, and then there's the last one with Tyler Durden there is sometimes you have to lose everything to do anything. So sometimes you have to kind of forget what you learned before. I had to forget, and not that I knew that much about it, but a lot of what I thought I knew about uh, first bull run, I had, to, I had to kind of give up on and um, start from scratch. And sometimes you do that. I mean, I know one fellow that wrote a very large his battle history. He worked on it for many, many years. And um, he thought he was done with it. And then another book on, that dealt with that action came out, and he said, geez, i got to start all over again. And he did, and I handed it to the guy. He, and he finally did publish that book. Um, I'm not going to say who it is, but uh, uh, that's called keeping an open mind. And sometimes keeping an open mind can keep you from timely on what you want to accomplish, okay? Because sometimes it's going to hit your face. Go, Geez, I've been wrong about this all along. It's happened to me a number of times, hopefully not as often as it would. Uh, it won't happen to you as often as it happens to me. <laughs> it happens to me all the time. I'm wrong all the time. Um, so, like I said, let's not be too comfortable standing on the shoulders of the people who come before us because maybe sometimes the people who come before us didn't have all the information we have. More information comes up every day. Um, there are letters that I've put out that, uh, say, for instance, John Hennessy has never seen before. And he says, boy, if I had this, I'd have used it in my book. And I could say that has happened, um, not because he overlooked it, just because it wasn't available before. And, and I don't know that it would change all that much, but it might have uh, changed it a little. So, but uh, that's it for the presentation. And uh, if there's any questions, if we have time for them, are we allowed to say, Tracy? So about the presentation, any details of the presentation or anything about First Bull Run or my website or anything else? Yeah. Uh, who was his superior? Did, did his superior review all his plans and all that stuff? Or was Who's his superior? Anybody who his superior was? Scott? Yes. 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 Did, did Scott review all this? Everything went fast. Uh, he, uh, McDowell, would have preferred to have four months to train his men. Um, Scott would have preferred to have more time. There was this newspaper editor named Horace Greeley uh, in one of his newspapers. What was it the Herald Tribune? 
it was just a Tribune then, it hadn't merged yet with the Herald, right? And um, it came up with this slogan. Everybody know what it was? What was going to happen in a couple months in Richmond? What was going to convene? Congress, the Confederate Congress, right? So the saying was, on to Richmond. So there was a lot of pressure. There was no pressure from the public on Scott or McDowell. And that's the way it's usually written. McDowell responding to public pressure for a forward movement, right? No. Who was the pressure on? Who was the pressure on? Lincoln. So who applied that pressure to Scott and to McDowell? Lincoln. So, you know, uh, there's the saying that uh, you're all going to like. Remember that one? Right? As to who really said it, uh, there's some differences of opinion. Uh, but then after the battle, uh, there was a famous exchange between Scott and Lincoln, where uh, Lincoln said, I mean, Scott said, it's all my fault. I let myself be pressured into moving forward before we were ready to move. Right? And then Lincoln's like, are you talking about me? I think you're talking to me. If anybody else here, you must be talking to me. And then Scott, oh, uh, he, he said, uh, oh, I, 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 I've never uh, shared the respect uh, of any president I've served under so much as with you. He didn't share respect with any president he ever served under. Remember that, right? You go back, cold bowl of soup, all that stuff. Um, so was he really saying, yeah, you're right, you know, I, I, it was my own fault, I don't blame you at all? Or was he saying, hey, this is my way of saying, yeah, yeah, it is you, you are the only one here. I don't know. But that's, what, and I didn't, that's not something I found. I mean, everybody knows that you'll, you'll read that in any history. You'll read that account just like you will the you're all green alike. The difference between you're all green alike is that one of the green people, one of the green group, the green men, if you want to call them that, were in a, a position they had chosen very carefully had chosen and had it occupied for a while. Yes? Why do you think McDowell was picked in the first place and not somebody like Bill Mansfield who was awful in Washington? And Mansfield's old, right? But that was the other choice. Um, I think myself that there was, first, his youth, uh, but second was that Ohio connection, and Chase probably had a lot to do with it. Because remember, uh, I mean, the first choice, they were just slow. I mean, McDo uh, McClellan was probably the first choice. But as he was coming from the west through Ohio, Ohio kind of grabbed him and, and got him to command the Ohio troops. Um, but he was from, McDowell's from Ohio, close with the Chase family. I mean, real close. I don't know if I read it, but uh, he, he, he and his wife designed the tiara, the Tiffany tiara that um, Kate Chase Kate Sprague, uh, Kate Chase wore in her wedding to Sprague, right? And and Kate, when she would leave Washington, would go and space, spend time with Mrs. McDowell. They were very, very tight. And you remember Simon Cameron wasn't a, a real go-getter uh, in in the War Department, the War Department back then. Yeah. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Isn't that weird? We had a lot more people died of disease, so, though. So, yeah. But, you know, actually in battle. Bad in battle, right. There weren't that many. You know, and so we were prepared to, well, okay, you know, maybe this might be, we might come to an honorable solution. Right. And if we can, you know, if we can get them to evacuate Manassas without killing any of our troops, they'll fall back to Richmond and maybe we can negotiate. That's a good and, thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, what did happen was the Confederates forgot to retreat. But you know, other yeah. than you know, other than that, and I think it, it, I think you know, he, I think it's to be respected the fact that his army wasn't ready to fight, and basically was trying to keep it out of a fight. And you know, let's let's see what we can do without killing a lot of people. 
Right. Well, two things I would point to that. Uh, Mark Grimsley, I think the name of the book is The Hard Hand of War. Right? Great book. Um, and early on, they talk about this belief. I mean, there are different schools in Washington. You had, like, the Blairs had their opinions, and um, the, the, the Radicals had their opinions on, on what they wanted to go on. And um, there was a belief that, um, you know, most of the people down there, they're not really behind this. These are, these are some fire-eater fringes that have somehow gotten a hold of the legislature. And if you look at the voting, you know, there's some support for that. Um, and that the, the, the people themselves are not really behind this. They're kind of reluctant. Um, so do we want to, how do we coax them back? And what Scott's referred to it was, we do the Anaconda plan and we let our wayward sisters come home, uh, come back. So uh, yeah, you do. I mean, you could say it's post-Antietam if you want, sure, or, or post-seven days or whatever you want to say, because certainly uh, popes, uh, communications indicated a more hard war policy um, at the time. But at this point in time, and that's what I said, we have no idea what people were saying to each other and what, what was said in, in private. We only know what was written down. And um, a lot of times stuff like that doesn't get written down. So they say, hey, look, this is what we want to do. Let's be as gentle as possible, but let's be forceful. Um, and I think myself, I think that, that this interpretation of what his plan was is more in line with that than in let's sneak up there and kill as many of them as we can. You know, it's uh, the old story with the, the two bulls on the hillside and all the cows down below. You know, I won't go into it because I'm being recorded. <laughs> but you know, it's let's come down there or let's just walk down there. So this is more of a walk down there uh, approach, I think. Yeah. And, and it changed, every, like I said, every time I do this, questions again. It, it evolves on what my, even my own thoughts on the plan are. There were more questions out there. None? Anybody thinking of one they don't want to say because it's stupid? What are the lawyers doing? What's lawyers? They're philosophy majors. Are you a philosophy major? Well, hey. oh, what do you mean by you? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. Is it fully formed? Will it ever be? This whole theory of mine, I don't know. What do you think? How many still were going to go, still want to go with, he wanted to overwhelm them uh, quickly and surprise them and with a flank attack? How many of you believed that beforehand? So I changed four people's opinions somewhat. Okay, well, four, we'll change four more and so on. It's like that old. What was that? Oh, was it a shampoo commercial? And so on. And so, on. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah. Um, any other questions? I wish I had like some pyrotechnics or something to end this with. <laughs> <laughs>